The province won't take ownership of Toronto subways, but it will get its so-called Ontario line. That's some of what came to light in the latest arrangement between the city and the province over transit. Here to examine the pros and cons of the newest in a long, long line of such deals aimed at moving commuters in the capital city, we welcome Karen Stintz, former Toronto City Councillor and a past chair of the Toronto Transit Commission. Cherise Berta, Executive Director at the Ryerson City Building Institute. And Matty Simiotiki, Associate Professor, Geography and Planning and Interim Director at the School of Cities at the University of Toronto. And we're delighted to welcome all three of you back to TVO for a conversation about this really uh, historic deal, uh, 28 million billion, excuse me, dollar deal between Queen's Park and City Hall. Cherise, start us off. What do you think? So in a city where not bad news is good news, <laughs> this is good news, uh, the province has walked back on doing something bad to Toronto. So that's good news. And um, the mayor and council fought hard and united and, and did really well. So I think that's great. But the province doesn't lose. They, they, they win as well. They realize that uploading the subway comes with a price tag of $22 billion in state of good repair bill just for the subway system. And who wants that on their books right now when they could instead defer a lot of the cost to the future, announce a new transit plan. But as we know, it's, it's easy to announce plans. We do a lot of that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's another thing to build them. Gotcha. Karen Stintz. Well, I, I think the public just doesn't even know what to make of it. I mean, everyone's in agreement. We actually have funding mm -hmm. and we have a plan that might actually get built. It's such a great conversation to have and it's not one we've had for a long time. Usually there's fights and bickering and this line or that line, we're not going to fund this or that. But now we have something that we can all really get rally behind and there's a real chance that this transit system could get built. So you agree it's a win-win? It's an absolute win-win. Maddie. I agree too. It's a, this is a good deal for riders and it's a good deal for both levels of government. For riders, it keeps the subway in one piece. It means that the system can be well integrated with the buses and the streetcar network without having to find solutions uh, to integrate it when it has different ownership. For both levels of government, the city and the province, it puts the funding in place, it puts the prioritization place in place, and now we can get going and start building transit. Can I follow up with this? The federal Liberals initially said the province hasn't done I guess enough due diligence, they haven't provided enough details about the Ontario line, the relief line, and therefore, you know, they were, they were holding off funding at the beginning. Uh, apparently they've had a change of heart. What do you think accounts for that? A consensus between the city and the province. Intergovernmental uh, collaboration has been very difficult in this country. There's been gamesmanship between the different levels of government and getting them on the same page has been hard. In this case, we've now found that consensus. We have four projects that are the top priorities uh, and that enables uh, the province to unlock the federal money and that's why the federal government has come on board now and is interested to get behind this plan. With all three levels of government, we can now get going if the deal holds and you always have to say that in this region. Yeah, the if council has not passed it yet, right? There's still a lot of hurdles and a long way to go, but if the deal holds, this is, we're on a good path. Why is transit, and you as a former head of the TTC would know this as well as anybody, why is transit so politicized in this city? Well, I don't think it's transit that's politicized. It's, everyone agrees that we need more transit. It, the, the bickering comes with the type of transit we're going to build with the limited funds that we have. And I think the real breakthrough we saw in this last federal election was that all the parties, the NDP, the Conservatives, and the Liberals all supported a transit plan that included subway mm -hmm. construction. And typically the NDP has been more, has been less reticent to support subway construction. They support LRT because they feel that's better bang for the buck. But now that we have, subways have now become a nonpartisan issue and everybody agrees we need to build them and all levels of government are committed to funding it. And so we have this, we, we, we haven't been in this place in, in my memory, hmm. that we've got alignment and consensus and agreement and dollars, real dollars behind the plan. Let's play a clip from one of the key players in all of this. Caroline Mulroney is Ontario's Minister of Transportation, and here's what she had to say about all of this. The clip, please. I think there's an opportunity here to stop playing politics. Um, I'm, uh, I, am, I was heartened by the, the, the tone of the negotiations between provincial officials and city officials on this. Uh, our goal here is to get transit built and uh, reduce gridlock and, and promote economic growth. And this is a chance to do it. And for the first time in a very long time, when the project of this, uh, this, this magnitude, uh, the city and the province are aligned. 
Cherise, the tone is different, you heard the minister say. They've managed to get a deal. What's contributing to this sort of era of good feeling that's broken out between Queen's Park and City Hall? Well, I don't have the inside scoop, so <laughs> all I can say is that um, I think we've reached a place where um, everyone kind of knows what, what they're dealing with, what, what their sandbox is. And if it's clear that the province is moving forward with these projects and they are, are paying for them um, with federal contribution, and then the city can look at, okay, what are we dealing with now? We have, um, we can keep our fare box, which is great. Um, they have that anyway. They don't have to contribute to paying for um, the Ontario's transit plan, so that's good. Um, the thing they don't get, they, they get to keep the gas tax, but not the new gas tax that was promised by um, the previous Wynne government, which was supposed to replace the tolls that she killed. That she mixed, yes. Um, but then Ford came along and took that away. So that's one source of funding that they don't have. Um, but then I think that they still get money from the Liberal government um, in their election promise to upgrade Young and Bloor, which, as we know, it's very dangerous there. You have to change upgrade the platforms and I think for some smart track stations yeah. um, and they also get the um, tax that Doug Ford um, imposed on the property tax for uh, Scarborough subway yeah. which amounts to um, about a billion dollars over 30 years so there's a little bit of money in there is that a Rob Ford or a Doug Ford sorry a did I say was a Rob Doug Ford, Ford? Yeah, okay yeah, yeah. Rob Ford I voted for that yeah. and that's the reason I know. <laughs> okay. my apologies okay. that's okay so that, uh, that was put on um, all of our property tax bills so that's that's hmm. an additional um, billion dollars so there is some money to play with, but there's not a lot of money to play with. Mm. But at least if you know that, okay, they're building these big lines, we have got, the city has got to do a lot to get people moving because it is not sitting still while we wait a decade or 15 years to build these things. They're long-term projects mm -hmm. and we are still struggling in, um, in traffic and congestion now. So the city needs to get serious about raising revenue to build more short um, term, well, well, quick to deploy options. And, mm. and they need to get innovative and, and think about things like more um, King Street pilots, mm. things like that. Let me do one more round on the notion of whether the subway ownership should have been uploaded to the province. And I know there is consensus at this table on that. Mm -hmm. There is a discordant voice out mm -hmm. there on this. Toronto Star columnist Martin Redcon, who writes, there is a reason why major metropolitan regions like New York and London have handed control of their sprawling commuter networks to truly regional decision-making bodies, rather than remaining at the mercy of local politicians whose first allegiance is to their city power base. Putting the capital-intensive rail lines on the province's books also permits deficit financing that Toronto cannot undertake on its own. Uh, you know, he's in favor of the uploading. The Conservative Party of Ontario once upon a time was in favor of the uploading. Mr. Ford has backed down on taking ownership of this transit system. Why do you think ultimately? Well, it's one of those things. I think um, there's no question they could have taken the subways. Mm -hmm. They would have had to allow the TTC to continue to operate to, because to your point, we mm -hmm. want it to be an integrated system. So you can't take one piece of the system away. And so th there's challenges with that. Mm -hmm. I think the reason they wanted to do it was so they could debt finance against the asset to build the subway. But now they've got another way of funding it with contribution of the federal government. They don't need to do that anymore. And I mean, and to the point you raised, it's a headache running mm. the transit system. And my guess is the Conservative government has enough headaches with, with what's going on across the school board negotiations and health care and everything else. Mm -hmm. They actually don't need this transit headache. They found a way to get their subways built. Um, they found a way to continue to keep the TTC operational. The city, the city and the province are in agreement. So you know, I think it could have been uploaded. I don't know that it would have been in the long-term interest of the city to have that happen. Declare victory and go home. Declare victory and go home. <laughs> yeah. Let's go through now. Okay, I'm going to, in, I'm going to, indul okay. be, I'm going to beg your indulgence while we go through a bit of detail here because um, Lorraine Barton sitting in for Sheldon Osmond today in the director's chair, and we're going to go through. Lorraine, I'm going to ask you to bring up these four maps one by one by one by one, and let's go through the four priorities that have been laid out, and we'll get all of you to weigh in with your thoughts. This is the so-called Ontario Line, 16 kilometers of track connecting the Ontario Science Centre in the northeast to Ontario Place, an exhibition place on the western lakeshore, and that's supposed to be, by the end of 2027, price tag almost $11 billion. Let's hold off there 
and I want to get everybody's take on the feasibility of doing this. I've heard, you know, for example, Adam Vaughn, the newly reelected MP, say mm -hmm. it's just drawing lines on a map. We have no idea how feasible this is. Maddie, is it feasible? I think we have to split this into different segments. Uh, the original relief line that goes uh, from uh, Bloor to Osgood, I think, is uh, buildable. And it's great that this project is going up to Eglinton in the first phase. Mm -hmm. There are uh, important communities there that are really suffering from a lack of transit uh, up towards the Science Center. It's really key that they're getting transit in the first phase. The phase uh, further west, out to uh, um, Ontario Place, that has never been studied before. That is a squiggle on a map that's going to need a lot more detail. In terms of whether this is feasible, we're still at very early days. And that means that as we get more details, it's very likely the cost is going to go up and we're going to see uh, time delays. The other issue is in the portion south of Girard. They're talking about going above ground uh, in the places where they build, either on an elevated guideway or at grade. That is a really tight corridor there, and there's some real questions about whether it can be built uh, in a way that isn't uh, extremely disruptive to the communities that surround the line. Karen, your take on the Ontario line. Oh, I mean, it's absolutely feasible. Um, it's just whether it can be built within the cost that they're uh, uh, suggesting it can be built within. And the timelines, and too. And the timelines, too. I mean, the, and, and there's no question to the point you raised. There will likely be changes because their original iteration may have to be reconfigured. It, it may not go all the way to Ontario Place, but I think the key piece is if it goes up to Eglinton and then connects to the to the Young University Spadina line, I think that will that is a key piece of infrastructure that we need to build if we're actually going to extend the subway north of Steeles. Cherise? Yeah, I agree with both Maddie and Karen. Um, it's a critical piece. It, this is one of the most important mm -hmm. things that we need built, so let's get building it. I agree with Maddie. Let's start with the north um, part of it. That's the most critical. It seems to already have the most design um, going for it, and then design the, the southern portion while that's being built. And I would also say I've heard people say that perhaps the um, more downtown area or southern area needs to be underground because of how dense the urban fabric is there. And what's interesting to note is in that in most cities, dense urban downtowns, usually you put um, transit underground and you usually put it more above ground in the suburban low density areas. We seem to do things opposite. <laughs> Here. But, and I, I, I do want to point out, I think it's important that they actually did rename it the Ontario Line because when it was called the downtown relief line, there was a sense that, oh, there's more transit for the downtown, mm -hmm. when really this line is going to serve the suburbs and the outer regions of the GTA as much as the downtown. That's a political so, nuance, but important. I think it? it's really important for yeah. people to buy into it and support it. And so next governments, because this, this is not going to get built in one term. Right. But w what we need to build is enough political support and political capital that the next government coming in doesn't believe that this is a negotiation, that we have to, we have to agree that this is a done deal, however it looks, and that we don't touch the transit plan anymore. Maddie, last word on this one? I think the key is that this line uh, hasn't been consulted on yet. The public really hasn't seen all that much detail in terms of how it's going to be built, exactly where it's going to be above ground, where it's going to be below grade, even what technology we're talking about. There's been a lot of debate about that. I think this is feasible. I think it has the potential to be a good plan, but it needs much more scrutiny. And typically with big infrastructure projects, as they get scrutinized more, as more design uh, detail gets done, the costs tend to go up and the timelines tend to expand. Right on. Just to add to that, I think understanding also things like fare integration how that's mm, going to work, mm -hmm. not just on the Ontario line, but all the lines. And then who's responsible after it's built? Are they just responsible for the capital investment and then walk away? And, and uh, Toronto's dealing with um, operational costs or maintenance, maintenance right. things like that. So I think all of those details need to be worked out as well. Okay. Let's go to picture two now, if we can, Lorraine. This is called the Young North Extension, uh, which is going to take on the Young University subway line. You can see, well, I'll describe for those listening on podcast. Finch Station, which is the top of that orange line, the young line, they want to build an extension now up into York Region. And that is aimed to be delivered by the year 2029, 2030, something like that. Um, okay, Maddie, come on in here and tell us what you think of this idea. Mm -hmm. I think as long as the relief line is uh, open, I think as long as they've rebuilt Young Bloor Station so that it's safe, I think this is a great project. I think we should be expanding beyond uh, the City of Toronto's boundaries, making this a regional transit system, because our, ci our city functions as a region. People cross these boundaries. They don't think about whether they're in the City of Toronto or in York Region. They think mm -hmm. that they're traveling to where their job is, their origin and their destination. I think this is a good project, but we need the other infrastructure in place that, that alleviates some of the congestion on the existing Young Line and makes it feasible for them to add more uh, transit. 
trains further north. I guess that's the key, eh, Karen? If they build this before they build the relief line, you're putting more people on the Young subway. Correct. That's, a, that's not the way to go. Well, and not only that, not only Young and Bloor becomes a bottleneck, which it already <laughs> is, Young and Eglinton becomes a bottleneck yeah. because now we've got the Eglinton LRT. So really, the, the Young University Spadina line, <clears throat> excuse me, between Finch and Union is really, really congested. And so being able to relieve some of that congestion is key. Is there any question in your mind that there will be sufficient traffic in places like Markham and Richmond Hill to warrant this kind of investment? I think it's really important. And for one thing to add is that Markham or York Region has built their bus rapid transit. For people who aren't familiar with that, it's kind of like light rail transit without the rails. It's, it's in its own lane, it's buses, it's... Um, it has its own signaling. It's not stuck in mixed traffic like Do a lot pollute? of our transit vehicles. Well, this is the other thing. We should really turn those, mm -hmm. make sure that we introduce electric buses when we're doing a BRT. Mm -hmm. um, so they have 35 kilometers, they're almost finished, of, um, of bus rapid transit. It's a network. And the waiting times are about two to five minutes during peak hours. Mm -hmm. And this should connect to the subway. You can get to the Finch subway through the network of BRTs, mm -hmm. but I think there's an added bit of incentive because you look at Markham, York Region, people drive, that's the culture there. Mm -hmm. And if you know that you're gonna jump on the BRT along Highway 7 and get to a subway, there's probably more incentive. There's a lot of time and investment mm -hmm. went to building that network. Um, mind you, just a number, it was only $1.4 billion to build 35 kilometers of BRT, rapid mm. transit. So one of the things we really need to learn from York Region is let's try and do that elsewhere. Better bang for the buck. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I don't want to let the clock get away from us here, so let's go to Lorraine if we can now. This is priority number three. This is the proposed Eglinton extension to Pearson Airport. This is the Crosstown. What do they call it again? LRT. LRT, yes. thank you. Yeah. Uh, out to Pearson Airport in the west and... Um, this is going 100 meters north of where we're sitting right now. A uh, $6 billion project, an enormous uh, project that's underway, and I, I guess still a few years away from, mm -hmm. from being completed. Well, I guess by the time they get the extension to Pearson, it's 2030, 2031, something like that. Uh, Cherise, the advisability of doing this plan in this way, what do you say? We absolutely need that connection to Pearson. We need it to the whole um, airport corporate center, which is the second largest um, employment center in mm -hmm. all of Canada. Um, That's amazing. Say it that is again. Amazing. Pearson Airport area is the second largest employment, employment center in the whole country. After downtown Toronto. Incredible. We need that. I'm not so sure we need it to go underground though. Um, it's interesting because the crosstown, parts of it are underground in the dense areas and then it surfaces and then it will go underground again, mm -hmm. which um, you, could, you could free up a few billion dollars to spend elsewhere on transit if you didn't um, tunnel it. I don't see the reason why you would need to do that. It's a low density area. What's your view on that? You know, I think when these plans are studied further, I think that there probably will be room to maneuver and that will be an at grade line so mm -hmm. that the money can get shifted over to the Ontario line. At grade meaning on at, the surface? At grade on the surface. Mm -hmm. I, I think that um, they probably undervalued the Ontario line in terms of costing. Mm -hmm. And um, if they don't tunnel the western part of the Eglinton LRT, they can use that money to the Ontario line. Hmm. Maddie. I think the key then is to see the, uh, these transit projects as part of a broader system. When we plan them in isolation, we're inclined to make decisions like putting projects underground, perhaps in places where it doesn't belong. Uh, I would say Eglinton West, uh, I would echo my colleagues on the panel, Eglinton West is not the place to go underground. But if that enables us to free up money to put into other projects and to, th and to invest in, as in, in our transit network as a system, I think that can be very positive. Okay, let's do one more here. This is priority number four. This is, what shall we call it? The mother of all transit controversies, I guess. <laughs> This is and the dear, dear to my heart. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Scarborough Subway extension uh, to be implemented by the year 2029, 2030, uh, at a cost we were told once upon a time of maybe three billion dollars. There's not a chance, and you know where that it's going to come in at three billion dollars. In fact, Maddie, let me ask you that: What does your research tell you about how long it takes these? How, what does your research tell you about how often these things come in on time and on budget? So the research on on time and on budget suggests that it's really unlikely. Nine out of 10 projects have a cost overrun and transit, public transit is most prone to the biggest cost overruns. The average cost overrun globally on a public transit project is around 45%. 
that's a big number when we're talking about a project that is already starting at around 3.35 billion dollars. Mm. The time aspect is also interesting. My colleagues uh, here at the University and I, uh, University of Toronto and I, have done a study on how long it's taken to get projects built here in Greater Toronto, transit projects. What we find, the projects that have opened in the last uh, decade, none of them got built and planned faster than 30 years. Mm. There is a 30-year runway from the first time it goes into a plan and gets debated and discussed to when there's the political consensus and then the financing and funding is in place, then the approvals, the procurement, the construction, and finally opening. That is a 30-year period. We're trying to expedite that now. I think that's positive, but we should understand that there is this very long history of projects taking a long time. And also, construction now on these big projects has become a challenge. We're finding with big transit projects that, uh, that, that many of them are delayed even when they're being built through public-private partnerships. Well, it's a 30-year period of planning and doing and building and writing when it's one plan. But as Councillor Joe Cressy has reminded us, you want to bring this tweet up? In 10 years, we have gone from a seven-stop LRT to a three-stop subway to a one-stop subway and 14-stop LRT to a one-stop subway, and now we're back to three. Meanwhile, nothing has been built. Uh, okay, Cherise, what is the likelihood that what we're going to see there is actually going to happen? I don't have a crystal ball, but all I can say is that um, we talk about winners and winners in this deal, and I would say those who are um, who suffer the most, I don't want to call them losers, but those who mm -hmm. suffer the most are people in Scarborough. Why? They're going to be waiting now over a decade, um, maybe 15 years, to get their three-stop subway. Um, but the other thing that's really critical here is that their rapid transit line, the one that's um, really aging, and it's going to be taken offline sometime in the middle of the next decade. Mm -hmm. Um, because this new configuration is going to take so long um, to get online, they're going to have a five-year gap um, between the two lines where they're going to have to be riding buses for at least five years. Let's just understand that. When, when the current Scarborough RT yeah. comes to comes its, its end, of life, end of life, people are going to be back on the buses for five years before the new Scarborough subway is exactly. built. Exactly, yeah. And I think that it really... Um, I, you know, what's ironic is that so many politicians have postured over giving Scarborough the transit it deserves, and it deserves a subway. Um, and in the end, they're the ones waiting the longest. And so I really think that there's an opportunity for the city of Toronto to prioritize the um, Eglinton um, Crosstown East, which is the extension of the Eglinton Crosstown, mm -hmm. which would serve um, a, a huge portion of Scarborough, go to University of Toronto Scarborough campus, and it would um, have 17 stops. Hmm. And, you know, that's a fraction of a price of it. So 5.5 billion for a three-stop subway, um, you know, around a billion and change for um, a 17-stop LRT. Which is done sooner. Which is done sooner. I'd like to posture. <laughs> As okay. the past politician and yes. one who was part of these transit mm -hmm. debates, I'd like to do a little posturing. Go ahead. Um, the fact that the uh, residents will be on buses or the commuters will be on buses, they would have been on buses anyway because the SRT route was the same LRT route. Mm -hmm. And so once the SRT was rebuilt as an LRT, they would have had to be on the buses anyway. And that was one of the reasons we actually said, let's extend the subway to build that extension of the Bloor Danforth line so that at least we can get the most out of the SRT and we can avoid the buses. We, didn't, we weren't able to achieve that because the timeline shifted. I think there is something else that is really important about this debate is that if we extend the Bloor Danforth line, those three stops, we actually end the Shepherd subway debate. What's the debate there? That Shepherd should be a subway. Because this extension of the Bloor Danforth line up to McCowan and then Shepherd East will then be an LRT. Hmm. And then we don't have to debate anymore whether there should be a, a Shepherd subway. I didn't know that anybody was still debating that. It's pretty Some people still that, debate it. Really? Yes. And so no I, I, think, I think that is all good. Now that that has been settled, once and for all, we can continue on to build the transit that Scarborough needs. And, you know, Scarborough is more than 500,000 people and they have three subway stops. I have three subway stops hmm. within walking distance from my house. Hmm. So there is a, an enormous transit inequity in Scarborough enormous transit inequity. And the issue is how do you solve it? Uh, you know, there's, there are many plans, many solutions, many discussions, many fights. But if we can agree that we're going to extend the Bloor Danforth line, it actually helps reduce um, 
having to change modes of transit for people in Scarborough who are trying to get downtown, and it allows us to get on with building the transit that we need. Maddie. My concern uh, with this plan is that uh, for the people who live further east, especially in uh, lower income neighborhoods uh, like Kingston, Galloway, uh, and further north into Malvern, uh, they do not get access uh, to a, a high quality transit through this plan. Uh, in the previous council, uh, the consensus uh, uh, that, was, that was formed to get the subway built, the Scarborough subway built, was that we would also fund the Eglinton East LRT. Mm -hmm. And that, has now, that project has now fallen off the table. And it means that people, uh, uh, who live in uh, communities further to the east, as well as the University of Toronto Scarborough, are not going to have uh, rapid transit uh, coming to their uh, anywhere near their door, even after we spend all this money on a subway. We need to be thinking of how we provide the best transit to Scarborough. I even if this plan goes through, we have to now come up with the strategies to make sure that it's part of an integrated network and that people can, can use it and move around uh, the region appropriately. University of Toronto Scarborough campus is a big destination point. Mm -hmm. How close? would a Scarborough subway station get to that campus? Does anybody know? Nowhere, nowhere. Close. Right, that's not the point, that. that's the point. So you're gonna spend four and a half billion dollars on a subway that's not gonna to go to the, one of the prime destinations. Five and a half. <laughs> five and a half billion by yeah. the time it's all said and done. And that I think that's that the won't point. Go, Whether it's yeah. one stop or three stops, mm -hmm. I mean, fine, build it. It's, the province is going to build it. It's not gonna be built anytime soon. And even when it is built, it's not gonna serve Scarborough. So what Scarborough deserves is a network. And um, you know we need to be looking in the city of Toronto of how do we deploy not only LRTs that are faster and more cost effective, but take a page out of Markham's book and look at BRTs. Um, Scarborough has a lot of wide arterial roads that you could run BRTs up and down, and those can be converted to LRTs, but they're just more cost effective, the quicker to deploy, and we need to get people moving. I got a minute left. Karen, let me give it to you to okay. talk about whether or not you think there are any other better alternatives out there that could get people into transit sooner. I, I think the best thing we can do to get people into transit sooner is to demonstrate our commitment to building transit. And now we have consensus among three levels of government. We have a plan that will be modified but fundamentally won't change. And I don't believe any further elections will be fought over transit. And so now there is confidence in the public that we are building the transit system and actually finally catching up to the population growth that will help us get people out of their cars and moving through the city. Perfectly brought in right to time. Thank, Thank you. you for that. <laughs> That's Karen Stintz, former Toronto City Councillor, chair of the TTC once upon a time. She's now the CEO for Variety Village. And uh, we thank Maddie Simiatiki as well from the University of Toronto mm -hmm. and Cherise Berta from the Ryerson City Building Institute where she is the executive director there. Great to have all of you on TVO tonight for this discussion. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.